You're listening to Something Cheeky, a collection of podcasts where two sisters discuss TV, books, and movies with just enough irreverence and far too many pop culture references. Welcome to Something Cheeky, the Gentleman Bastards edition, where we discuss the lies of Luck Lamora, book one of the series by Scott Lynch. I'm Nikki. I'm Rosanna. Today we're covering the 15th interlude, The Throne in Ashes. In this chapter, we see the true power of the Bonds Magi, and you know what they say about playing with fire. All right, Rosanna, what do you consider a revelation from this interlude? It was super short. I think the point of this interlude was to give a history of the Bonds Mage and to give an example of their power. Yeah. And then to just a little bit touch on the fall of the Theron throne. Mostly, I think the point of this, though, was to give us a little bit of background as we go into this Locke versus Falconer face-off. Okay. What was your favorite quote this time? I don't know if I could call this a favorite quote. <laughs> This was very short. Nobody talked, so there's no dialogue. All history. But I think that an important point was, in less than two hours, one-third of the Emperor's forces were slaughtered. Ah, uh, yeah. That's a fast battle! It really is. I mean, that's, a, that's quick to kill that many people. With only 400 people on one side. Yeah. Yeah, this chapter was... George R.R. R. Martin could have written it. It is, like, one of the... The Song of Ice and Fire um, kind of background pieces. Just history. I don't think we even get the name of the Emperor, do we? We don't get any characters. Yeah. Known or new. Mm -hmm. There's no body specific. Yeah, it's groups. It's soldiers. It's the Emperor in general. The Bonds Magi. And that's, that's it. And the Vatrans. So it starts out, we find out that Theron Pell is the name of the city. It was called the Jewel of the Eldrin. It's full of elder glass. It sounds like more elder glass there than really anywhere else. So I wouldn't be surprised if it had been like the capital that the Eldrin used as well. Yeah, that makes sense. When they were around. It was the base of the Theron Throne Empire. It had roads leading there from all the city-states. We get their names Carthane and Lashane, Nesek and Talisham, Espara and Ashmere, Iridane and Kamor, Balanel and Isara are the names of all the city-states, that all have dukes that are ruling under the emperor. And it makes it sound a lot like Rome when it was the height of its power. They had, you know, all these engineers built actual roads from Rome to all these different places around Europe. And it was really getting colonized and civilized as well. Having the emperor brought a lot of the city-states together, and so there was peace at that time. For the most part, when the Vatrans appeared in the north... And of course, all I can think of, of course, is uh, the White Walkers in the North. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they need a wall. <laughs> I don't think a wall would have helped in this Probably situation. Not. No, no. Uh, but the Vatrans were pirates, and they took a lot of the Northern Territory. They started beating the Theron armies, and Theron thrones started to really decline. They were really weakened, but they weren't beaten quite yet until the Bonds Magi of Carthane came along. They had been there in Carthane for a while. They were starting to expand to other cities, and they refused to bow to Theron Pell, to the emperor there. And really, why would they? Yeah. They had no reason to. Yeah. The emperor sent his court sorcerers to defeat them, but the Bonds Magi killed them all. Sounds like pretty easily. And it said, the emperor's declaration of war was a test of resolve for the new guild's rules. For anyone who dared to harm a Bonds Mage, they had publicly vowed reciprocity that would be awful to behold. And we find out it really was awful. You know what? It wasn't a blood eagle, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, we just watched an episode of Vikings where they performed a blood eagle, which is this brutal ceremony where it's it's just absolutely disgusting. It's it's horrible and torturous. So bad. Ugh. And it kills someone in the end. And it's. I would rather be burned alive. Actually, I just imagine I would faint so quickly having that oh, happen. Totally. I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. Still very fresh in my mind. Yeah. Uh, the Emperor has his army march to Carthane. After about a dozen Bonds Magi were killed, 400 of them all got together and took on this army. And as you said, it took two hours for them to beat them. They used all kinds of magic. Uh, strange mists boiled up from the ground to mislead their maneuvers. Illusions and phantasms tormented them. 
Flights of arrows halted in the air and fell to the ground, or were hurled back upon the archers who had loosed them. Comrade turned upon comrade, maddened and misled by sorcery, that could chain a man's actions as though he were a marinette. The emperor himself was hacked to pieces by his personal guard. It is said that no piece larger than a finger remained to be burned on a pyre afterward. So, uh, he dead. <laughs> they were beaten. And it sort of reminds me of, like, evil mutants. <laughs> you know, like, an X-Men, when the X-Men are fighting other mutants, and they're all using uh -huh. these sorts of whatever their uh, ability is. Yeah. It reminds me of, like, a mutant fight. Which I dig! So, <laughs> I wasn't totally mad about it. I would like a book just about the Bonds Mage. I always think of, uh, when you say, you know, all the powers against each other, like the mutants, Captain America Civil War, when they're all at the airport, and they're all yeah. using their powers against each other. And yes. Yeah, that was the most fun scene in the whole movie. That was a really fun scene. I know a lot of people said they didn't like that movie, but I enjoyed it. Then Paul Rudd showed up, and it was hilarious. And oh he my got big, gosh. and then he got small. And... <laughs> He's such a funny Ant-Man. I have to say that the new Spider-Man, I cannot wait to see Spider-Man Homecoming. He is already my favorite Spider-Man, and I've only seen him in the in a little bit of this movie and the trailers for Spider-Man Homecoming. He is the Wonder Woman version in Avengers. <laughs> he is. Because he was such a great part of Civil War, just like she was such a great part. She was the best part of Batman versus Superman. So, yeah, Spider-Man, he was a standout. I think he stole every scene he was in. I didn't even need RDJ for that. And that's saying something. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I'm a big Robert Downey Jr. fan. He's my movie star husband. <laughs> you know how you're, like, allowed to have one? He's mine. Mine's Matt Damon. Okay, that's weird. That's not weird. Matt Damon <laughs> no, is fantastic. Not, no, he is. You're right. He's he's great. I just... He's not on my list. <laughs> Good, because he's mine. <laughs> so, you keep your RDJ. He's a little too um slick for me. He is a little slick. He's a bad boy. But also a good boy. <laughs> See, I have been in love with Matt Damon since Goodwill Hunting. This is so weird. I did not know this about you at all. Really? Oh, I love Matt Damon so much. Yeah, he totally rivals Tom Hiddleston. <sighs> now, to me, I have to classify them by, like, nationality so I can have more than one. <laughs> so Tom, Tom Hiddleston is the English version. Yeah. <laughs> you know what about Matt Damon? He plays smart characters. Yeah. And the whole intelligence thing is super hot. Definitely. I agree with that. Um, the Bonds Magi want to send a lasting message, because apparently defeating an entire army in two hours isn't enough for them. Because that's so forgettable. <clears throat> oh, yeah. They just go in a little overboard. They go to Theron Pell, and they burn it. Burning it is an understatement, even. Basically fossilized the place. They level it completely. Yeah. It's all ash and black concrete. And you can see the column of smoke from really far away. I was just imagining the Great Wall of China. Kind of. People say you can see it from the sp from space, which you can't. Wait, yes, you can. No, you can't. Can't you? No. No, you can't see it from space. I'm going to look it up now, just to be sure. But I am almost positive it's a myth. Hmm, okay. I misheard that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm never doing this with you again. <laughs> I must have been mistaken. Oh my god. I hate you so much. <laughs> I disavow all knowledge of your horrible, horrible puns. Oh my god. You are your father's daughter. Also, you had a lisp, so I'm making fun of you too. Hey, <laughs> jerk face. <laughs> Mini pig fish face. <laughs> You're a mini pig fish face. <laughs> One popular myth about space exploration is that the Great Wall of China is the only human-built structure that can be seen from space. But this is not true. The reality is that you can't easily see the Great Wall with an unaided eye, even from low Earth orbit. So, ha. Huh. So even though the flame was so hot, and the first thing I thought was, is it going to mess with the Elder Glass? It did not. I thought that too. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was not strong enough to to even even do anything to it at all. What is this stuff made of? <sighs> Something from space? Speaking of space, maybe the people of the current time are descendants of aliens. So the Eldrin are aliens, but they're mm-hmm. also the same as the current people. Maybe the current people aren't humans. Ah. Maybe they're just similar to humans or similar to what we think are humans because we're reading it. We're not part of this universe. They might not even be on Earth for all we know. That's true. You know, they never actually describe people's faces very much. Maybe they have weird alien faces. Well, to them, they're normal alien faces, Nikki. God, rude. It's like that Twilight Zone episode where everyone thinks that she's so hideous and they take off her bandages and it turns out that she's beautiful for our standards and everyone else looks crazy. They all have pig noses. Yeah, but because she is different, she's hideous. Yeah, we don't know this is Earth. We don't know these are humans. Yeah. Maybe they're all blue. Maybe this is Avatar. Whatever planet this is, Earth or not, maybe the Eldrin came from a different planet. And But you know what, though? That doesn't really make sense either. Because there's a lot of Elder Glass. So they just, like, mine an entire planet and just bring <laughs> buildings worth of this stuff? No, probably not. So maybe they made it. Yeah. Maybe it's an alchemical thing that they created it. Uh. And that's why it's indestructible, because it's made out of a combination of things. I don't know. Maybe the Eldrin and the the people here, the humans, have an evolutionary or a common ancestor, the way that humans do, with, uh, oh. with monkeys. Yes, with they split at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So the Bonds Magi burned everything else in the city to ash, including people that didn't manage to make it out of there. Which is really sad. So they burnt everything except for the throne, the emperor's throne itself. So all that's left in Therimpel is a burnt city and a chair in the middle of this wasteland, which is just a reminder that you don't fuck with wizards. Which, that's a good lesson for anybody. Yeah. Nobody goes there because they don't even want to remind the Bonds Magi that they are in charge because they know it already. So this didn't just make the Bonds Magi super powerful or show up for when they were super powerful. It started hundreds of years of war between the city-states because now they had no leader, which also led to the Kingdom of the Seven Marrows in the north where the Vajran were. It led that to grow really powerful because it was more cohesive than the city-states that were left in the south. So two hours of battle just completely changed the history. Yeah, of the world there. Yeah. And also, when I first read this, I remember being surprised that the Bonds Magi had been around that long. Oh, For hundreds yeah. of years. Because mm-hmm. it seemed like a, a more modern kind of group. So next week, we're going to read chapter 16, called Justice is Red, and the following interlude, called A Minor Prophecy. What are your predictions? What? A prophecy? Yeah. I'll tell you this about the interlude. It is two-thirds of a page long, if that. A prophecy? This is the first we've ever heard of anything like a prophecy. A minor prophecy. I I can't tell if this is a sarcastic title (laughs) or if it's like legit no big deal. A minor prophecy and justice is red. Give me something. The only thing I can say about justice is red is probably blood. Ah. Justice, another word for, in some cases, revenge. I cannot imagine how it would be possible for Locke to get the upper hand with the falconer. Oh, okay. But I'm definitely hoping for that. Yeah. And the only reason he needs to get the upper hand is to get access to Raza. I still don't know what sort of motivation the Falconer has for helping Raza this long. (laughs) I really cannot figure out how this is going to get tied up. I just am am lost. So you seem awfully worried about what the Falconer is going to do. Well, the interlude just showed us what he can do. Yeah. Not to mention what we've already seen him do. He's a terrifying person. Yeah, just imagine him times 400. Yeah. That'd be pretty scary. I mean, it really makes me wish that I was a Bonds Mage. Just because that <laughs> seems like a lot of cool power. But I wouldn't want to be on his bad side. That's a problem. Oh, it might, 
kind of suck to be a bonds mage. I don't know if you have much control over the contracts that you take. Really? Why? I wonder if the contracts are handed out by your superiors, by people in charge. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you do get to choose. I thought they were all just like free agents. Ah, maybe. But really, we've not been given enough information to know that. So what do you think the prophecy is? I didn't know there were prophecies in this universe. <laughs> How can I guess what it is if I don't, if I didn't even know that they were existed? <laughs> I can only imagine it's about Locke. The whole book is about Locke. The book is named after Locke. That's true. A child will come who's really good at stealing and he'll <laughs> best a gray man. I don't know. <laughs> a gray man. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think Locke is going to get the upper hand with the falconer if he is? <laughs> Maybe he's going to punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it worked with Forchenza. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you think he gave me it close enough to do that? I just don't know. Okay. I don't think that Locke can gain the upper hand with the falconer. Oh, okay. Just the two of them in a room. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. So... The only thing I can guess is that the Falconer is going to have made a decision not to kill Locke for yeah. some reason. Maybe he's going to make a deal with him. Maybe he's got some sort of secret that we don't know about yet that's going to be revealed right at the very end. I mean, they're not going to be friends. <laughs> I've given up on that idea. But I think the only way Locke is going to make it out... I just... I hate to say... That the only way he's going to make it out is if the falconer allows it. But I just can't see any other way. Yeah. How could he possibly best him? I mean, he can dress up and think things out and all this kind of stuff, but he has no power. Unless the prophecy is that Locke will all of a sudden get power. Ooh. Like magical power? All of a sudden he's going to be a wizard. A bonds ah, mage. okay. He's just going to all of a sudden, it's going to kick in like uh, puberty. Yeah, I, I'm full of half answers and guesses, wild guesses. Do you want to find out what happens? I do. So I'm going to try something a little different in this episode. Chapter 16 is broken up into several parts, and I'm going to read the first part to you so you can find out what happens next. You know what I'm going to do as soon as we're finished, right? Read the rest? Exactly. You ready? Yes. Chapter 16. Justice is Red. The falconer moved his fingers, and Locke Lamora fell to his knees, gripped by an all-too-familiar pain that burned within his bones. He toppled onto the floor of the hovel beside Jean. What a pleasure, said the sorcerer, to see that you survived our little arrangement at the Echo Hall. I'm impressed. Even despite your reputation, I had only imagined we were too clever for you. Only this afternoon I thought it was Jean Tannen alone that I sought, but this is something finer by far. You, Spatlock, are a twisted fucking animal. No, said the Mons Mage. I obey orders of my paying client, and my orders are to make sure the murderer of my client's sister takes his time in dying. The falconer cracked his knuckles. You I regard as a windfall. Locke screamed and reached out towards the Mons Mage, willing himself forward through the pain. But the falconer muddled under his breath, and the racking, stabbing sensations seemed to multiply tenfold. Locke flopped onto his back and tried to breathe, but the muscles behind and beneath his lungs were as solid as stones. When the Bond's mage released him from this torment, he slumped down, gasping. The room spun. It's very strange, said the falconer, how the evidence of our victories can become the instruments of our downfall. Jean Tainan, for example. You must be a fantastic fighter to have taken my client's sisters, though I see you suffered in doing so. And now they've struck back at you from the Shadelands. A great many divinations are possible when one of my kind can get his hands on the physical residue of another man. Fingernail pairings, for example, locks of hair, blood on the edge of a knife. Jean groaned, unable to speak from pain. Oh, yes, said the falconer. I was certainly surprised to see who that blood led me to. In your shoes, I'd have been in the first caravan to the other side of the continent. You might have even been left in peace. Gentlemen bastards, hissed Locke. Do not abandon one another, and we do not run when we owe vengeance. That's right, said the Bonds Mage. And that's why they also die at my feet in filthy fucking hovels like this one. Ventress fluttered from his shoulder and settled into another corner of the room, staring balefully down at Locke, twitching her head from side to side in excitement. 
The falconer reached inside his coat and drew out a sheet of parchment, a quill, and a small bottle of ink. He uncapped the bottle and set it down atop the sleeping pallet. He wet the quill and smiled down at Locke. Jean Tannen, said the falconer. What a simple name, easy to write, easier even than it was to stitch. His quill flew across the parchment. He wrote in great looping whirls, and his smile grew with every letter. When he was finished, his silver thread snaked out around the fingers of his left hand, and he moved them with an almost hypnotic rhythm. A pale silver glow arose from the page in his hands, outlining the curves of his face. Jean Tannen, said the falconer. Arise, Jean Tannen. I have a task for you. Shuddering, Jean rose first to his knees and then to his feet. He stood before the falconer. Locke, for his part, still found it impossible to move. Jean Tannen, said the bonds mage. Take up your hatchets. Nothing would please you more at this moment than to take up your hatchets. Jean reached beneath the sleeping pallet and took out the wicked sisters. He slipped one into either hand, and the corners of his mouth drew upward. You like to use those, don't you, Jean? The falconer shifted the silver threads in his left hand. You like to feel them biting into flesh. You like to see the blood spatter. Oh, yes, don't worry. I have a task you can set them to. With a sheet of paper in his right hand, the falconer gestured down at Locke. Kill Locke Lamora, he said. Jean shuddered. He took a step toward Locke, then hesitated. He frowned and closed his eyes. I name your given name, Jean Tannen, said the bonds mage. I name your given name, the truthful name, the name of the spirit. I name your name. Kill Loch Lamora. Take up your hatchets and kill Loch Lamora. Jean took another halting step toward Locke. His hatchets rose slowly. He seemed to be clenching his jaws. A tear rolled out of his right eye. He took a deep breath and another step. He sobbed and raised the wicked sisters above his shoulders. No, said the falconer. Oh, no. Wait. Step back. Jean obliged, backing off a full yard from Locke, who sent up silent prayers of relief, mingled with dread for whatever might come next. Jean's rather soft-hearted, said the falconer. But you're the real weakling, aren't you? You're the one who begged me to do anything to you as long as I left your friends alone. You're the one who went to the barrel with his lips closed when he could have betrayed his friends and perhaps lived. I know how to make this right. Jean Tannen, drop your hatchets. The wicked sisters hit the ground with a heavy thud, bounced, and landed just beside Locke's eyes. A moment later, the bonds mage spoke in his sorcerous tongue and shifted the threads in his left hand. Jean screamed and fell to the ground, shaking feebly. It would be much better, I think, said the falconer, if you were to kill Jean, Master Lamora. Ventress screeched down at Locke. The sound had the strange, mocking undertones of laughter. Oh, fuck, thought Locke. Oh, gods. Of course, said the falconer. We already know your last name is a sham, but I don't need a full name. Even a fragment of a true name will be quite enough. You'll see, Locke. I promise that you'll see. His silver threads disappeared. He dipped his quill once again and wrote briefly on the parchment. Yes, he said. Yes, you may move again. And as he spoke, it was so. The paralysis lifted and Locke twitched his fingers experimentally. The bonds mage wiggled his silver thread once more. Locke felt a strange something seemed to form in the air around him, a sort of pressure, and the parchment glowed again. Now, said the falconer, I name your name, Locke. I name your given name, the truthful name, the name of the spirit. I name your name, Locke. Arise. Arise and take up Jean Tannen's hatchets. Arise and kill Jean Tannen. Locke pushed himself up to his knees and rested on his hands for a moment. Kill Jean Tannen. Shaking. He reached out for one of Jean's hatchets, slid it toward himself, and crawled forward with it clutched in his right hand. His breathing was ragged. Jean Tannen lay at the bonds mage's heels, just three or four feet away, on his face in the plaster dust of the hovel. Kill Jean Tannen. Locke paused at the falconer's feet and turned his head slowly to stare at Jean. One of the big man's eyes was open, unblinking. There was a real terror there. Jean's lips quivered uselessly, trying to form words. Locke pushed himself up and raised the hatchet. He bellowed wordlessly. He jabbed up with the heavy ball of the hatchet. The blow struck home right between the falconer's legs. The silver thread and the parchment fluttered from the bonds mage's hands as he gasped and fell forward, clutching at his groin. Locke whirled to his right, expecting an instant attack from the scorpion hawk. But to his surprise, the bird had fallen from its perch and was rising on the hovel floor, wings beating uselessly at the air, a series of choked hat screeches issuing from its beak. Locke smiled the cruelest smile he'd ever worn in his entire life as he rose to his feet. It's like that, is it? He grinned fiercely at the bonds mage as he slowly raised the hatchet ball side down. 
you see what she sees, each of you feels what the other feels. The words brought him a warm sense of exultation, but they nearly cost him the fight. The falconer managed to find concentration enough to utter one syllable and curl his fingers into claws. Locke gasped and staggered back, nearly dropping the hatchet. He felt as though a hot dagger had been shoved through both of his kidneys. The sizzling pain made it impossible to act or even to think. The falconer attempted to stand up, but Jean Tannen suddenly rolled toward him and reached up, grabbing him by the lapels. The big man yanked hard, and the falconer crashed back down, forehead first, against the floor of the hovel. The pain in Locke's guts vanished, and Ventress screeched once again from the floor beside his feet. He wasted no further time. He whipped the hatchet down on a hammer blow, breaking Ventress's left wing with a dry crack. The falconer screamed and writhed, flailing hard enough and briefly to break free from Jean's grasp. He clutched at his left arm and hollered, his eyes wide with shock. Locke kicked him in the face hard, and the bonds mage rolled over in the dust, spitting up the blood that was suddenly running from his nose. Just one question, you arrogant fucking cocksucker, said Locke. I'll grant the Lamora part is easy to spot. The truth is, I didn't know about the apt translation when I took the name. I borrowed it from this old sausage dealer who was kind to me once, back in Catchfire before the plague. Just like the way it sounded. But what the fuck, he said ever slowly ever gave you the idea that Locke was the first name I was actually born with. He raised the hatchet again, reversed it so the blade side was toward the ground, and then brought it down with all of his strength, severing Ventress's head completely from her body. The sound of the bird's suddenly interrupted screech echoed and merged with the screams of the falconer, who clutched at his head and kicked his legs wildly. His cries were pure madness, and it was a mercy to the ears of Locke and Jean when they died, and he fell sobbing into unconsciousness. That's part one. Wow. That's all you get for now. What do you think? That's intense. As soon as he said that all he needed was Locke, I was like, psh, that's not Locke's name. <laughs> we talked about that in the very first episode. Were you worried about Jean actually getting injured? What were you worried about Locke when Jean was under the spell and then vice versa? I could not imagine that Locke was going to be killed, but I okay. was getting concerned that Jean might be. Ah, uh, okay. I mean, I was going to be really mad if that were the case. There's still several parts to this chapter. And also, now that the Falconer... <laughs> he's not dead, but he's insane. <laughs> no, he's been through a huge pain because he felt Ventress's head getting cut off. But it didn't kill him. It just killed Ventress. Right. So I, I, I guess, I, since I don't know what caused the connection between the two of them, I don't know what severing it does. Ah, uh, Okay. Because if they're really connected and Ventress is dead, either the Falconer is just not connected to the bird anymore, or mm -hmm. he's half of a being. Oh, uh, okay. I think that Locke needs to cut off the Falconer's head, too. <laughs> <laughs> but then he'd have all the Bonds mages after him. And we learned that from the interlude. How do they know, though, that that happened? Like, he misses a check-in? Or do they all get, like... A beeper <laughs> where the page comes over, this one just died. <laughs> it's revenge time. There's probably some spell they could work that could lead them to his killer. So they just need to keep him alive, but incapacitated. Until what? I don't know, though. Because no. <laughs> they're just going to drag him around weak in a Bernie style. <laughs> just forever. Yeah, so. <sighs> hmm. I don't know. I'll have to read it and see. Mm -hmm. You're going to be up late tonight because I know you're going to finish this as soon as we stop recording. Yeah, I will, I'm sure. Do you want to make any predictions based on what we just found out? Any additional? Yeah, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. That's our episode. Please leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at SemCheek and Facebook.com slash SemCheek. Please visit our website, somethingcheekypodcast.com, to send us questions, feedback, and learn about our other shows. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.